Hello, everyone. We're back with Caleb for uh, the next chapter of uh, Varieties of Religious Experience. Um, I'm just going to quick uh, recap what we talked about last time, and then we're going to go into the next chapter. Last time, we talked about uh, James' first lecture on conversion, and he gives uh, a couple examples of famous people who go through these uh, conversion experiences, but the way that he, kinds of, he kind of... Um, describes um conversion is almost he talks about when you're when you're thinking you have this kind of hot spot center of personal attention and then there's these other peripheral ideas that you have around you but you have this one kind of thing that you're focused on where you're he calls it the the center of habitual attention or something like that what does he call it the habitual center of personal energy and this is the center of your attention and there's these peripheral things. And then if that shifts to something and you, um, and it stays committed there. So if you shift your attention to something different in your life and it, and it stays like that, that's an example of a conversion. So a conversion is in some sense, like an upheaval of your, um, soul and a reorientation of your soul. You can think of a conversion like that. He describes it more that way, as opposed to a conversion being something like, um, this is what I believe. And then tomorrow, I believe something else. Now, what you pay attention to and what you believe, these are obviously related things, but he's kind of pointing that more at its heart, what's more important is what you're paying attention to. So the next chapter is also on conversion. And uh, he, it's called Conversion Concluded. And so we're going to get into that now. Yeah. Uh, so he... Um, talks about how the case of Paul and his conversion um, in Acts is uh, it's a very focal example of conversion, um, and it's definitely one of the most um, well described um, that you see in the Bible after um, Jesus's ascension. Um, and it's play uh, the the role of conversion, especially like a sudden conversion, um, plays a more prominent role in, in Protestant theology than that of uh, Catholicism or orthodoxy. Although he doesn't really, I think he addresses orthodoxy once or twice in the chapter, but only very I, briefly. I don't even think he's mentioning, he's not talking about Eastern orthodoxy. He's just saying orthodoxy as a word. Yeah. Meaning um, the standard correct doctrine. Yeah. yeah. And so he really doesn't address like Eastern Orthodoxy that much, but um, yeah, so it, it plays a greater role in Protestant theology. Um, and then he, he goes into a couple cases uh, of some examples um, and he's focusing in on sudden conversions. So not the, the gradual shifts that you can see where someone goes from one hotspot to the other, but one where it snaps and it's very um, quick seeing one person go from one side to the other. Um, so he first starts with Aline, who um, is described himself as being uh, miserable, um, being like consumed by his misery and sorrow. Um, and then he, when entering his house, um, hears a, a still, small voice. Um, and he comes to this realization that all of his spiritual efforts, all his, his um, like, energies that he's put into knowing God have come to nothing, um, hadn't accounted for anything. Um, and so he sees his Bible, reads Psalm 38, um, describes it as feeling that God was praying through him, not as if he was praying. Um, and so he said in that moment, he submitted himself to God, um, and was filled with redeeming love. Um, he felt, that the burden of his guilt had gone away um, and he was compelled to preach, um, which is one of the common things that you have seen in these um, conversion cases, mm -hmm. um, especially with the, the sudden ones. Um, and then he also lost his taste for carnal pleasures, um, which is also interesting. You'll see that in a couple of other cases as well. Mm -hmm. um, which I thought was interesting because um, most people, even today, when they talk about being born again Christians, will still describe themselves as being 
not only succumb, uh, succumbing to temptation, but feeling temptation for like things of this world. And so um, there's definitely something that's special and unique about these cases compared to like normal conversions. Um, yeah. Um, and he describes his, he talked about a little bit at the end of last chapter where he was talking, there's two, I, this might relate a little bit to the, the thing of, um, the, the, the submission kind of conversion where you submit to some higher power and something act through you or the, um, volitional one where you're moving step by step towards something. The volitional yeah. one doesn't really apply here so much because you don't, try for some sudden event nobody mm -hmm. says i want a, a conversion right now they might be very desperate or searching for something so it seems like a line was pushing for the volitional um system but it wasn't working or for some reason and then he had a sudden one yeah and uh there's another case of of someone who's at least one or two at the end of the chapter of people who are pushing for some kind of conversion um and they nothing's happening and then all of a sudden something clicks yeah um, but there are other cases where it's just out of the blue um and that's that's um one of the next cases coming up but james describes uh describes Aline's uh conversion as his redemption was into another universe and that um the natural world that he continued to exist in um life was just a sad and patient trial mm -hmm. um so um, it's not just a frame of the difference in um, how you think about the world, but how you perceive the world and how he felt the world. Um, yeah, acting upon him, not just how he should change, how he should act upon the world. Um, and then he uh, cites another case from Professor uh, Luba, who seems to be another one of the few people who is doing um, like gathering cases and doing study of religious experiences. Yeah. Um, seems similar to what James was doing. Um, and so um, he doesn't give us a name, but says it's a correspondent of professor Luba and says it's a case similar to um, Colonel Gardiner. Um, or I think and it's this, Garnier. Is he uh, he uh, no, he's Scottish, but he got oh. converted in France. Oh, um, okay, there you go. Yeah, I actually went and looked it up. It's a crazy story. Um, this guy who is colonel in the Scottish military, and he was at one time fighting in France. He uh, he got shot in the mouth. Bullet came out his neck, um, and even like as he was dying, he was like trying to, he was like focused on making sure that he like didn't lose any gold or anything. So uh -huh. he was very like focused on things of this role, but he like clots up the neck, uh, his neck wound, passes out, survives, serves in the French court for a while. Um, and the article describes it as he indulged in all the lewdness of the French court for like five years. Then he reads like, faithful Christian soldier or something like that. Yeah. Um, and while reading that, he has a vision of Christ saying to him, um, like, I poured out for all my blood for you. And this is what you do with the sacrifice I made. And the guy like turns around instantly converts and spends the rest of his life being a preacher. Um, and so, um, the correspondent of Luba is um, son of a clergyman, but he didn't go to cl uh, church, um, sought carnal pleasure, um, wasn't interested in sp spiritual matters or spirituality or anything of the sort. Um, but he, he would feel guilt for how he lived. Um, but he described himself as being of good health. And when he was converted, um, he hadn't been drinking for the past month or so. Um, and he read a book on spirituality um, for literary purposes because a, a friend had asked him to read it with him. And he was struck by a line, um, he that hath the son hath eternal life. He that hath not the son hath not life. And um, 
felt like there was another being in the room, was overwhelmed by God's love and was saved. Um, he says that he didn't repent and that God never asked me to repent. He felt no regret for his past. Um, but the next day he was out um, harvesting the fields and he had too much to drink. Um, and he came home, realized that, and he realized that he had to give every aspect of his life to God. And so he did that um, and never felt temptation after that day. So that's another uh, case of just giving up um, or losing all sense of temptation towards um, doing evil. Um, and the next one is even weirder. Radispone. Oh, yeah. He was um, a religious French Jew and had an older brother who became Catholic. Mm -hmm. And he was like totally uninterested in faith he was totally uninterested in in following anything and then he just walked into a church somehow and then all of a sudden he just saw the virgin mary he was overwhelmed and then he the first thing he did was look for a priest and then he converted to catholicism right there and it's not as if this was not a moment where he felt terrible about himself it wasn't like he was in a depression necessarily or anything like that but it still happened suddenly Mm -hmm. Right. He just wasn't looking for it. It just appeared. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because he was in the church just following a friend um, who was making a stop at the church. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about the vision, too, is he describes like everything that he saw disappeared and he only saw the Virgin Mary. So it wasn't like someone appeared for before him in like the field of vision that he had, but it was just everything disappeared and he was overwhelmed by it. And if you think about his vision as like a tunnel, it's like mm -hmm. it's going some way and then all of a sudden narrows on Mary and then it comes out again, right? So yeah. it's like this and then it focuses on the experience. It's intensely focused and then it branches out again, meaning everything after this point branches from that experience. So the mm -hmm. tunnel of experience is now completely filtered by that lens, the lens of Mary now. Yeah. It's like a telescope. His memory functions like a telescope. Yeah. Um, and he, yeah. James talks about how um, during a conversion, someone can feel like a passive spectator. And this is a good example of that. Like yeah. the guy had, had no intention whatsoever in becoming saved um, and felt no compulsion towards it or no like need for it. And it just happened to him, not in any way, um, him trying to, not the volitional kind of conversion at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and well, and then James starts to talk about um, this suddenness, is this an essential part of conversion? And, and then he starts talking about different Protestant theologians who have talked about this. Yeah. Um, and so Methodism is one where you have a greater emphasis on um, the suddenness of a conversion. Um, but even within Methodism and revivalist uh, denominations, uh, there's still splits on the meaning of the suddenness of a conversion and whether it's necessary or whether it's special even. Um, yeah. but and he cites um, yes. John Edwards too who says conversion must be preceded by despair right that's mm -hmm. what it is to convert right or the despair might in some sense be the repenting the realizing that you're you, that you need the conversion or something like that that's what Edwards is trying to emphasize yeah and I think that's by and large true but not necessarily always true that's yeah that's not what it needs it, you don't need to um pin the obviously these experiences happen right mm -hmm. sudden conversion experiences but there's nothing essential about them to conversion itself right and yeah. obviously it's a very good like um if you're trying to convince someone that they're saved and you don't have any external means of convincing them, then 
if they do have a sudden conversion experience, this functions very well as a focal point for them. Yeah. If that kind of conversion happens, it's not wrong, but a, you can't exactly build a church on the reliance that whoever's had this kind of experience is a genuine part of the, the church. Cause these things can happen that you're confused by and you don't know why they happened and you can't rely on them to happen to everybody too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, but I don't, I don't think Edwards's line um, conversion must be preceded by despair necessarily only has to apply to a sudden conversion. It's okay. like in, in volitional um, conversion, you're mm -hmm. actively pushing towards something and despair and dissatisfaction with your current state can be a powerful force pushing you that way. Um, especially like if, you know, with Christianity, you believe like um, futility of the world and the need to like worship God and repent of your sins. And so that necessarily, or yeah, it means that you have to recognize that you're going from a place that is worse to a place that is better. Mm -hmm. So having at least some sense despair prior to it makes a lot of sense. And I think only rarely will you have cases where you have someone walking into the church feeling fine, but then see the Virgin Mary and converting. I mm -hmm. think it's possible to convert without despair prior, but I think it's a rarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, well, well, yeah, let, let's let's move on because I think he gets more into this stuff later too and in a more technical yeah. way, which I want to get to. So um, this next section, he starts to talk about um, consciousness being like, he uses words like transmarginal sub and subliminal. So like you was kind of like what you talked about in the last chapter, you have these things you're focused on and then there's these colder spots around it. So this is what I'm mostly doing. I'm paying attention to. And then there's these things around me, which um, are part of my consciousness that maybe they're not the center of it. Maybe they're completely outside my purview, but they are a genuine part of my consciousness. Something we usually call today subconscious. Mm -hmm. Right. And so he starts to, he starts to uh, focus in, and uh talk about that again and um and then he starts building up and now and then he starts using the word automatisms now what exactly is an automatism uh i didn't look it up but from his the way that he described it it seems like your subconscious acting in a way that you're consciously aware of it, but don't have any conscious power to stop it. Right. So it's like a part, it's like a reflex kind of, I guess. Kind of, but not necessarily like reflexes. We kind of associate with being very fast and sudden. I don't think automatisms have to necessarily be quick or spontaneous. It's, or it's a, it's a thought quick. that moves itself in a way. Yeah. Yeah, and ever people, everyone I'm sure knows what these things are where you have a sudden real, you might have thought about this in the past and pushed it away, and then all of a sudden you come to a realization that, oh, actually, I should be, um, I should change my major or something. You know? Yeah. Oh, like I've, 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 I like this, um, person or, or a person I've been hanging out with, but then all of a sudden I realize that I, I don't want to talk to them anymore. You know, like, oh, I realized that I wasted a lot of time or something like that. And these are like thoughts that you might have. And then all of a sudden they like show up, yeah. you know, and then you, and then you can actually act on them. With trans, um, just to go back a little bit on trans marginal consciousness, is that just talking about like what we talk about being the subconscious or is that something somewhat different? Cause I could, that this section was one that kind of, confuse me a little bit i don't know um subliminal just means like under the normal yeah and then trans marginal i think i think trans marginal would mean it's at the margins and then it moves somewhere else or it moves to the center perhaps 
I'm not sure. He might have a okay. specific meaning, but it, it, they all kind of mean the same thing, peripheral at the edges, uh, not the center of focus. And that, that level of consciousness exists. Yeah. 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 A good example that he used of automatisms was people who are given a command under hypnosis mm -hmm. and then they come to and then their trigger or whatever causes them to act yeah. in a certain way and their consciousness will justify it but not by you know referring to whatever the hypnotist did but they'll come up with some other excuse for what they're doing even though they're doing it because their subconscious has been suggested to do something under hypnosis and so you're acting and consciously aware of something even though you don't know why you're doing it which is a classic h3h3 video you gotta watch if you haven't watched before on psychics mediums and gurus that's a classic haven't. video that's definitely worth it check it out after this video that's one of my favorites actually from a long time ago that's from like four years ago now wow I'm, i think exactly four years ago that video came out okay that's a great this guy this guy is like, looks like an orange um, but the um yeah and um what is that oh that is probably hayden possibly james yeah okay, okay cool. <laughs> yeah so so oh and i think the way that he describes the hypnosis is like so if i've got the watch or whatever the thing that I'm making you do, you spend such intense focus on that, right? And then everything else that they say becomes these marginal things. And they basically, they can skip your conscious and get to your subconscious and start teaching that thing. Yeah. So and then, yeah. Yeah. And then your subconscious causes you to act in a way that you're consciously aware. And it totally takes your conscious mind for a loop because it doesn't know what's going on. Mm hmm. So, and then he starts to say, okay, well, so this is related to sudden conversions, specifically the suddenness of a conversion is usually people that have sudden conversions, as opposed to gradual ones, have these sudden kind of subconscious activities, right? So somebody that does go through a massive conversion experience, it's usually because they have uh, subconscious activities going on. Or um, so all these other people, the, the examples before, the one guy had um, a lot of guilt from um, his father, perhaps being a pastor. And the other, um, the first one, Henry Align, had um, a lot of guilt from, or from him, his spiritual volition failing. And then the French uh, Jewish guy, it's nothing, it's not clear, but there must have maybe something subconscious from his brother's conversion. You know, yeah, maybe something about him realizing that his brother has converted and this means something, then he pushes that down. But subconsciously, when he gets to the church, he sees Mary or he realizes it or something happens. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And then he's and then James starts to get to there, there's the spots where James starts to get to these points where he knows that he's doing all this psychology. So someone can say, oh, you're just trying to psychologize away. The religion and then he just starts and he goes oh no 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 and he, he makes himself clear what he means when he's talking about these things so he says um he wants to make sure that the point is that the value of the conversion depends not on the process but on the fruits so something's value the conversion's value is is this person now focused on is this person genuinely converted not how were they converted necessarily sometimes how they were converted matters right but but what matters is are they now in a state where they will be faithful are they now do they now have faith so he says yeah. saints are not venerated for the type of conversion that they have but for the christ likeness of their actions right yeah and it it goes in line with with christian doctrine with jesus talks about um, can a fig tree bear grapes? And then it pops up in James again, um, like a salt water spring can't produce fresh water. Um, and so if you 
so that you've internally converted, but you have no external change. That's not a conversion. That's not any kind of change that has occurred. So your your change your change is recognized by its results and not the process. Yeah. Um, Yeah, sense. and and so he says it's it, so you shouldn't privilege sudden conversions. Mm -hmm. So you have all these people who have these gradual conversions. The people that we should be venerating, we should, in a sense, we should um, celebrate conversions, no matter what's going on. But we shouldn't over celebrate the conversions. So we shouldn't have, have we start to have like conversion birthday parties. Convert. Oh, I converted a year ago. Oh, let's have a party for it. You know. Like, oh, I was born again, birthday parties. You know what I mean? As if like, this is the moment that it happened and it stopped. It's the, the event of your faith happened at the conversion. He says, the conversion is important, clearly, right? But it's more important what your life after the conversion is. So, um, and convert, you, don't, you don't want to celebrate a conversion on its own because you don't know what the, the conversion is actually doing until you see it last for a while. A conversion is like a fruit that you can potentially harvest, but until you harvest it and maybe cut it up and then start to serve and cook it or whatever, that you actually know if it's rotten or not. So Satan, can you, if, if your entire focus is on the conversion and the conversion experience, Satan can induce little conversions all over the place and make people think that they're, they're um, you know, reveling in Christ when they're really not. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I think it's the, the focalness, though, of the, the sudden conversion that makes it seem like it's something that is more spiritually significant than a gradual process. Because someone who's had a conversion experience converting to whatever, at least they have some focal moment that they can say, I once was this, now I'm this, and it happened in this moment. And so it gives you something to look at and it's very black and white and there's no shades of gray in between, even though like someone who works through the process of becoming converted very gradually mm -hmm. might not have a specific moment to look at and they might have a more fruitful conversion and have a more fruitful Christian walk or whatever. Mm -hmm. but they don't have any particular moment to look at and it can almost feel like empty or, or bleak looking back and not being able to find that one specific spot in your life where it happened. Yeah. And I think that the black and whiteness of it is less is, it is obviously very important to that individual's lives, but it's also, it serves as a proxy membership status thing when you don't have any other method of of saying this person is a part or not part of the church right so it's the sudden conversion experience had became elevated in protestantism because they didn't have another method of sorting between in and out group you know yeah if we're going to have a left hand right hand path we've got to have some method on earth we don't have to but it's very useful to have some method on earth of divining who is going to heaven, who is going to hell. And well, obviously it's whoever's focused on Jesus, but then who is focused on Jesus? Oh, well, these people have had these experiences where clearly, that, clearly if anyone is, it's them. So they're like set. And then these other gradual people, oh, well, maybe they like are going to have their conversion soon, but it has to actually be this active, like wild thing that happens one day. Yeah, it was common in Calvinist societies, especially um, because they would try to prove that they were predestined by their conversion experience. And so when you have that focal experience, you can say, I was predestined because God did this in my life in this moment. And so mm -hmm. someone who doesn't have that focal moment is always wondering whether they were predestined or whether they're just doing okay on earth and which is somewhat at the heart of um weber's protestant ethic thesis but that thesis is not 
great. It's, inter no. it's an interesting piece of um, sociological analysis, but it does not by any means explain. He, he tries to use it to explain capitalism, where for those who aren't familiar in, in Calvinism, um, you, you're predestined to heaven or hell by God, but um, those who are predestined there are signs of their salvation on earth that God gives that. So we know the, so material success can be a sign that God favors you. Right. So if the more you work and the more you um, attempt to gather riches, um, maybe you'll actually get rich and then that'll be a confirmation to you that you're saved and a display to others that you are um, favored by God which is kind of silly and, and not very good to me. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Weber tries to say like, oh, because people were doing this, they started to become more productive and the capitalism started, but that's just probably not true. Yeah. There was um, many other things going on and many other non-Catholics around. If capitalism started in Holland and in America and in England, that's not where Calvinists were predominantly. So. Yeah, um, I've I've heard and seen papers talk about how Protestants Protestantism's broader focus on education and liter uh, literacy was what had the the effect on making Protestant countries more productive than that's Catholic awful, ones. Too. Yeah, and awesome. it it shows up and does okay in like multiple regressions and stuff. But I don't. I don't think it's all of it either. And yeah, of course. just a little disclaimer: like, um, not most Calvinists today would not say material wealth is a sign of predestination. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but that was that was something that a view that was held more commonly during the 16 and 1700s, but mm -hmm. it's basically all gone away now. So yeah. Don't pick on your Calvinist friends for it. Yeah, it's it, Calvinism kind of, and Calvinism is, is in so many different branches and there's so many different types of it and it's mm -hmm. changed a lot over the years. So, yeah. Um, okay, and then he starts talking about uh, Professor Co. Who is who? What was Professor Coe's shtick? Um, oh, he's also documenting that people who have sudden conversions typically have an active subconscious life. And that's some of the, the results that he finds. Yeah. Um, that's interesting what necessarily causes someone to have a more active subconscious or subliminal self. Um, mm -hmm. And then how that, how that manifests and how you can test it because they they talked a little bit of doing of i think it was co's methods in in doing stuff and it was a little bit sketchy it was more like hypnotist like suggestibility and stuff um but his thesis kind of makes sense mm -hmm. kind of tracks with james mm-hmm and then he just mentions sanctification, the idea of sanctification. He says, sanctification is the result of the new self after conversions, which makes sense. But I would even push in another direction. Sometimes the process of sanctifying yourself is part of what gets you to convert. So the gradual type is sanctifying themselves. And this does shift their focus to God and slowly converts them. So if you're able to give up some bad habit, then it's going to make it easier for you to focus your attention on this new thing. Yeah. So if you think of like a political conversion, if I get rid of the habit of watching some conservative news outlet, it's going to sanctify me to the degree that I can now convert to the left or something like that, you know? So it works in a lot of different directions. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then again, he gives one of these moments like the um, where he's like, "Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to deflate the religion here." And so he says, "Of course, conversions, sudden or not, can have the presence of God." 
you know, there's no reason to believe that there isn't. Yeah. Understanding the nature of the process does not necessarily mean there's not some external force acting upon the process and making the process yeah. become initiated or whatever. Yeah. Um, All he's really explaining here is the idea that, um, that the sudden, a, a person that has a sudden conversion is much more likely to be a person that has peripheral problems. So, and that, that's almost like a tautology. All he's really saying is if a conversion is sudden, it's because they didn't expect it. So that's all he's really saying in the chapter is you, a sudden conversion is just an unexpected conversion. Um, which if somebody wants to rely on the fact that sudden conversions happen as evidence that there's some extra force, and if you build your argument that the existence of supernatural things is that like, oh, look, somebody had some kind of experience where something happened really fast. Nothing can explain that except for some outside force moving someone. He's saying, no, that's not true. It might be something else. It's just the mere fact that they didn't expect something to happen and it happens. That's all that a sudden thing is. Yeah, but I think you could interpret it um, because his his work on automatisms can see seem like maybe a challenge to um, the degree of the religiousness of the conversion um, because I, he goes into this a little bit more um, in this next section, um, but about how autonomous autonomisms um can you can see light you can hear voices you can have like your body moving without control and so in cases like that someone could attribute and think that it's only this could only be explained spiritually and he's he's saying there's also a, a naturalistic explanation for it so i can see how someone who if they had some kind of sudden conversion and they saw light or they heard a voice and they thought oh the only way that this can be explained is spiritually could read this and think that he was challenging the religiousness of their conversion yeah and um yeah, so again, he's just saying, I'm not ruling these things out. <clears throat> just because obviously there's so many people at the time that are going, oh, well, we have all these new things about psychology, so we can explain all the uh, all of religion as these little psychological complications, right? Like a very Freud approach to things. And he's saying, no, we can learn a little bit about more about the pathways inside your mind. That doesn't mean we explain everything. Do you? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Then you've got another conversion example of a um, guy who became a French Protestant, Adolphe Monod. Um, and he was overwhelmed by sadness. Um, and he, he recognized his own corruption and thought that him trying to save himself was like the blind trying to lead the blind. And so his conversion was definitely not one that was gradual or worked towards. Um, and so he realized that he needed help from some entity outside of himself um, and um, something clicked with him with the, um, the Bible and he surrendered himself to God and he describes his melancholy of not leaving him, but it had lost its sting. So it's another kind of case of mm -hmm. past, past suffering or um, like conflict or temptations being either done away with or um, having no active effect on the person who's realized the conversion. Yeah. Um, what, what is this passage that uh, we have right after that? Yeah. Is this from Luther's personal experience? Yeah. Um, 
it's it's talking about um, how how Luther. Um, it's it's interesting um, because it's talking about how Luther and um, his the the pain that he was in prior to his conversion and the emphasis emphasis on the sickness of his soul um, helps the conversion that he had be more of a sudden conversion because he's going so far from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. Um, And he describes um, Lutheranism as being a very, um, a more denomination dominated by people who are likely to be sick souls and more likely to have sudden conversions than in Catholicism, Mm -hmm. Um, which is interesting because we've had people describe Catholicism as being the morose and um, six-souled denomination of Christianity. So yeah, Protestantism and Catholicism have definitely been viewed in a variety of lights relative to each other. Um, yeah, and I think in, in some sense what happens with when Protestantism splits out from Catholicism is it almost sorts itself into different people more easily. I, so I think that fundamentally the biggest difference between Protestantism, um, certain types of Protestantism and more hierarchical um, forms of Christianity is that they have the tendency to sort themselves out into subgroups more easily, right? So yeah. Catholics are forced to somehow agree with other Catholics no matter what their emotional set is no matter what their political beliefs are right yeah so you know in a sense republican catholics and democrat catholics depressed catholics and super excited catholics are forced to be integrated together somehow in some way that republican protestants and democrat protestants are not even if they go to the same church Mm -hmm. so yeah um so like whereas the Protestants who start to think like, oh, Luther was a little bit too much this way, or Calvin's a little bit too much this way, they can splinter off. So you you have much more liberty, but then your liberty does not force you to reconcile. Yeah. Your your liberty gives you the liberty to not reconcile with others. Mm -hmm. It creates like this unity within the, the groups. You don't have any chance to, you're not forced to like reconcile your your differences in how you see Christianity, um, but then you also expect there to be more divides within Catholicism than within like Lutheranism or um, you know Baptists or whatever. Which you do definitely see a clear divide between liberal and conservative. Catholics, especially today. Um, yeah. The switch from the previous Pope to, to Pope Francis now has been one that's definitely kind of sparked that disunity within the Catholic Church. But I think that's one of the problems in the Catholic Church is that they have to pin their entire existence on the one guy. will of one guy, mm-hmm. which is not... It doesn't seem right to me, but both, I mean, both the Catholic and the Orthodox churches cannot have survived this long without having learned how to integrate different people somehow. And so somehow they've succeeded, Mm -hmm. right? Whereas Protestant churches don't really have concern for, are we integrating people for the long haul? You know, they're just... Or integrating certain personalities of people or types of people Mm -hmm. yeah 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 okay we we can move on because i want i want to get into that stuff but i need to know a lot more to do that yeah okay in this last section he talks about the faith state Mm -hmm. yeah yeah as being like the state of of moral unity and he he has three three characteristics of it so the first one is um a state of 
assurance. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a loss of worry and then you've got like inner harmony and then a willingness to be or exist. Um, and then more specifically within Christianity, you'll have people describe that as like justification or salvation. Um, but then um, with this state of assur assurance, you'll also have um, a sense of like perceiving and recognizing truths um, that you didn't know before. Um, and they'll often be like something that the, the convert can't describe. It's beyond words. Um, and so um, one point is also the, the world will see appear to have objectively changed. Mm -hmm. um, and Jordan Peterson has a, a series called Maps of Meaning. Um, I've been where, watching the Harvard lectures. Okay. Which is the Maps of Meaning course that he did in 96. Oh, wow. Okay. Which, that's the earliest videos on his channel, mm -hmm. which he looks like he's like much younger. Yeah. Like much sillier. Mm -hmm. He talks sillier. Yeah. I don't even think he talks sillier. I think he's more serious. I don't know. Yeah. I can't listen to him at once, one speed though. I have to put him at 1.5 to listen to him because he, he goes too slow. Mm -hmm. But in. That isn't almost everything at two speed now. That's a little too <laughs> too fast for me. But um, in part five of the the 2017 series that he goes through, um, he starts to describe how people in the the 60s thought that we were information processors and that we we took in information in unbiased. Um, manner and then we we processed it and then formed a model of the world from that information and then when our model was disaligned with what we perceived then that would cause like emotional conflict and then we have to update our model of the world um and then to so that we could resolve the disharmony between our model of the world and the information that we were taking in Mm -hmm. um, but then you've got um, studies like the one with the, the gorilla that walks through the basketball players um, and it pounds its chest and then walks away and people don't notice it because they're focused on, um, on counting the basketball players or whatever. And so the important lesson from it is that you don't take in information in an unbiased manner, that you're current frame of reference, your current um, interpretation and model of the world shapes the way that you, not only the way, but the information that you take in. And so when you have some kind of situation where you have a conversion, um, that means you've gone from having one interpretation, one model of the world, and you snap over to having a different model of the world. And because you have that different model of the world, your focus is going to be on different things and you're going to perceive everything as being different because you've got an entirely new lens that you're seeing the world through. So someone who had an idea of like us taking in information in an unbiased manner might not understand seeing the world objectively changing, but our objective understanding of the world is fundamentally affected by the lens in our interpretation of our model of the world. And so having some kind of dramatic shift in our model of the world will fundamentally change our subjective view of the world because we don't really have an objective view of the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, McCloskey uses this word conjective to mean in between subjective and objective. I don't know if it, means anything but she said it and i like it so, <laughs> so it's like people will will worry when you start doing thinking that way oh everything is just this internal subjective thing no it's not really it's just kind of like a, a different a translation box so mm -hmm. it's um it's in, in one way i think you can see um this the pragmatism stuff here which is what Peterson does and it's what James does as sort of a, um, it's like Kant, but he'll, but with a lot of more flexibility than Kant. So yeah. 
we can uh, we can talk about that later. But um, yeah. Um, anything else that we've got in here? Um, he goes into permanence of conversion and then touches on automatisms a little bit. And I just want to hit before we leave the case of a guy who wanted to pray to convert to Christianity, but every time that he tried to pray, he felt like he was being choked. And so he eventually realized that he would rather die trying to give his life to Christ than like not be converted. And he, his throat was physically being closed up because he, I think he passed out when he was trying to pray. And then when he woke up and came to everyone around him was celebrating and he, he felt entirely different and felt as he had converted, but it was, I think it's the most dramatic and um, like poignant example of an automatism, like acting on someone while they're trying to convert. Um, and, and that's on page 250 if you want to check it out. But um, yeah, very weird. Lots of weird stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But um, James says that like, automatisms have very little spiritual significance. And I think that would be something that maybe like someone, especially like in a, a Methodist denomination might disagree with or find a problem with um, given their emphasis on the suddenness of conversion and the experience of the conversion. So him saying that there's very little spiritually going on with the automatisms is might there is there something does he mean to say that it has little it does have little spiritual significance or it doesn't just automatically have spiritual significance like somebody just having an epiphany realizing something do we have to explain that with um supernatural spirits i think that's all he's saying is yeah a, a sudden conversion might as well just be an epiphany of conversion mm -hmm. like you suddenly realize something yeah Think about it. Realize you you make it real. You make it something that you now consider real. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not real. It actually makes means it's real. Yeah. Realize something means it's real. Unless you're realizing the wrong thing, then you have this satanic influence. <laughs> yeah, um, but at, at least what he's saying is seeing lights or hearing voices or feeling like you're being choked while you're praying does not necessarily mean something's going on that something spiritual is occurring, um, which could ruffle some feathers. Don't share every Facebook post is what he's saying. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then the last thing is permanency of conversions. Yeah. And the, yeah. And it's basically him just saying, if, if people have declining religious enthusiasm after their conversion experience, doesn't mean nothing happened. Doesn't mean God isn't real. Doesn't mean it's all a sham. Just means sometimes people lose interest in things, even real things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He describes them conversion experiences as being like a, a high watermark for um, religious experience. It's something yeah. that's, going to be the peak of a spiritual experience, but it's not like a state that you'll exist in for the next 40 years after being converted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, great. So next time we've only, okay. How many, how many more of these are we, do we've got? We've got one, two, three, four, five basically five wow that's not many yeah the next couple are really long but <laughs> still so yeah next next um week is going to be on saintliness this is probably the chapter i'm most excited for yeah so in a way i think what he's going to be doing here is he's going to be and be talking about the fruits of conversion if i if i can anticipate correctly so yeah that's what I'm most excited to hear because if apparently that's what's important. So now we're going to learn what he thinks is important. Yeah. 
So that's pretty yeah. cool. Very cool. Uh, we'll see you next time. All right.